So my name is Matthew Avery. I'm the session chair here, uh, but all I'm really doing for this, I think, is, is reading this and, and introducing Dermot Park. Um, but uh, so that's who I am. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce you all to Colonel uh, Nicholas Clark. He is an associate professor in the Department of Mathematical Sciences at West Point, where he's the program director for West Point's Applied Statistics and Data Science program. Uh, Nick received a BS in mathematics from West Point in 2002. Uh, master's in statistics from George Mason in 2010, and a PhD from Iowa State in 2018. His dissertation was on self-exciting spatiotemporal spatio statistical models. I will not be talking about that. <laughs> um, that's next. That's yeah. later on this afternoon. Um, and he's published in a variety of disciplines, including spatiotemporal statistics, best practices and stats methodology, epidemiology, and sports statistics. Um, what did you do in sports statistics? Uh, we did a analysis. Esports. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Exciting topic. Lots of data. Sure. Um, Nick is the former director of the Center for Data Analysis and Statistics, where he conducted research for a variety of DOD clients. Colonel Clark served as the chief data scientist for Joint Special Operations Command while on sabbatical from June 2021 through June of 2022. While in this role, he created the Army's Data Literacy 101 course, teaching fundamentals of data literacy to Army soldiers, civilians, and contractors. Since inception, he and his team have delivered over 30 course over the course over 30 times to a wide variety of army organizations. That's what he's going to be talking about today. Uh, Nick's also a veteran of DataWorks, many DataWorks in the past, and so we're excited to have him back. Please welcome Colonel Clark. Thank you, Matt. I was telling Matt uh, before we began here, this is sort of a, a full circle journey for me because the last data works I intended in person was in 2019 pre-pandemic when I was on a panel and we were talking about how do we educate data literate leaders in the Army. And we talked at that point in time about what we were doing at West Point, some of the innovations we had been doing in our introductory statistics course, talked a little bit about our major, and then kind of set that aside a little bit. And um, when I was on my sabbatical, and I'll talk through kind of how this came out. I, I sort of noticed there was this, this gap where we were doing a good job of educating really people like these guys over here who really want to be in this space. We're doing an okay job of educating like every army officer that goes through West Point. But that big gap uh, is really the rest of the army and what's going on there and how can we take some of the lessons that we've learned at West Point and apply them to the rest of the course. And, and I was struck by a couple of things our speaker said this morning. The first is um, when Ms. Fox had said, you know, the, the answer to everything is AI. It sort of reminded me of the old Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The answer to the question is 42. We just have to figure out what that question is. And that's sort of where the Army, I think, in the Department of Defense struggles with a little bit, is coming up with the questions to ask of the systems that we have sitting in front of us. So we'll talk through what this what this means uh, in terms of educating the rest of the force in data literacy. I'll kind of cover the data literacy 101 course that we've developed. And I'll say this is joint work that I've done with uh, Jim Starling, who's sitting up here, who is the current Center for Data Analysis and Statistics Director at West Point. And a lot of the courses and and the coursework that we put together for the data literacy 101 is, is coming out of the work that uh, Jim has done. So just kind of was working. Right again. There we go. Just to kind of um, start from a big picture, where where does this problem exist? And I came across a article in the Harvard Business Review. And I really want to put the article in here because I can say the word sexiest, right? So is, is data scientist still the sexiest job in the 21st century? And this was a rejoinder to an earlier article that was published in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, I think around 2019, probably the last time I gave a talk at DataWorks, that said, a data scientist, that's what you need to be. Like, that's where, that's going to be the great hot job in the future. And before that, Hal Barron famously said, you know, statisticians, that's, you know, that's what, you know, the future holds. And this article that was recently published was sort of lamenting the fact that this didn't come true. So looking back, we said this was going to be the great job. And we still think this is going to be a great job, having data scientists inside an organization. We value that for the organization. But for the most part, it's failing. 
And they were kind of going through why this is failing. One of the things they said is many organizations still don't have a data-driven culture. And I kind of had that in mind. And then I read the uh, Secretary of the Army's uh, implementation plan for, for her primary objectives and said, hey, we got to promote this culture of data-driven decision-making. And it was just this word culture that kept coming up over and over and over again. Like if we truly want organizations that can take advantage of data, it's not enough to just build data scientists. I got to figure out a way to touch everybody inside of the force. And as, as Laura Freeman said out there, and I think this is what everybody should have, is that baseline understanding of data literacy. So what is data literacy? When we, when we say these this term, it's kind of thrown around a lot. If you go on LinkedIn right now, a lot of people love to talk about data literacy. Like, what does this mean? So as we started looking at this, um, as we started thinking about what this course should contain, as an academic, I went to literature. That's the first place I go as I kind of look and say, all right, what do people say about data literacy in, in the peer-reviewed journals? Guess what? Not much. Like, there, there isn't a lot out there. So I said, okay, well, how can we define this? And one of the the good books I came across that really did a good job of framing this is a book by a guy named Jordan Morrow, Be Data Literate. And when he says data literacy, it's really the ability to read, write, analyze, and communicate data. Informally, kind of do you speak data? And this to me is the individual level skills that everybody inside of the Department of Defense must have if we truly want to be able to take advantage of the AI algorithms that the panel just talked about last time. And you see the Army CDO kind of echoes that too. It's, it's not enough to just have a small cadre of folks, my data science majors at West Point, the, the folks who, you know, the grad students that were talking last night at their, their poster sessions. If that's all we're relying on, we're going to be in the exact same situation that the authors of the Harvard Business Review were talking about, where we're going to just make their lives miserable, and we're not going to actually have any meaningful change inside of that organization. So why do we need this? So as Matt mentioned, I was serving as the uh, chief data scientist for the Joint Special Operations Command as part of my sabbatical. Um, I'm, my job for the Army is I am a professor, and every once in a while they say, hey, get back out to the force, uh, figure out what's going on. So I got to do this job. It was sort of an interesting job in that it didn't exist before me, and it's not existing after me. They said, hey, you're a free chicken. This is what we want you to do. And I said, great. What does the chief data scientist inside of a special operations command do? And they said, I don't know. You tell us. I said, okay. So I started working on some science projects, you know, kind of the things that we see in the posters, like, oh, I'm gonna build out this algorithm that does blah. And I was like, eh, I don't know. And then all of a sudden, August of uh, 2021 happened. Anybody remember August 21? What was going on in the world? Pulling out of Afghanistan. Yeah, the Afghanistan withdrawal. So the Afghanistan withdrawal happened. And I, at that point in time, I had a team of folks that were working for me and some really talented individuals. Like I had um, folks with master's degrees from Stanford in data science who could really code and really, really hook and jab in this space. And we never really got to the point with the data that was coming off of the battlefield that we were able to do anything with it. We spent all of our time cleaning our data because this is what was given to us. And in fact, this is a clean and sanitized version of the data sets that were provided. And if I was thinking about the actual data set, it probably had about 100 other columns, each equally messy, ton of missingness. And, and if you're, you know, if you're have any training in data, you look at that, you're like, oh, that's horrible. Like, you can't actually do anything with this. We had mixtures of formats, we had citizenship, and and well, this is, seems sort of comical. We did have please California and California misspelled. So obviously, like the, the meaning behind the data, and I, and I will say this is people that were seeking U.S. help in Afghanistan. So these were um, people that were trying to get the U.S. to 
uh, evacuate them as the Taliban were coming closer and closer to Kabul. So this, this is the type of stuff that we're getting off the objective. And it was sort of like they just took it and threw it over their fence and said, we got you the data. Now do data science to it. And so we, we never really got to the point where we were able to achieve anything. And it kind of dawned on me at that point in time that if I think about my data workforce like a medical workforce, if I kind of have that, those, those, similar, um, those similar structures, like we had a really good job of training my brigade surgeons. I've got graduate school opportunities for people that really want to work on this. I had a, a I felt like we had some good opportunities for my platoon medics, like people who who knew a little bit about this, maybe they had an undergrad degree and they wanted to upskill, like what they want to learn how to code in Python. We had Coursera courses that they could they could uh, they could take. But what we really, really didn't have is sort of in the army, we have combat lifesaver training. So everybody that goes out of the goes out on the battlefield has a basic level of medical um medical expertise. And, and it's not that I wanted to make doctors. It's not that I want to make more platoon medics, but, but I needed somebody who could stop the bleeding right there on the battlefield at that point of collect. And this to me was sort of the equivalent of that. that there was things that could have occurred at point of collect that would have allowed my equivalent of my brigade surgeons to actually be able to operate on this. But instead, the entire problem was punted to the folks sitting back in the rear, and they never actually got to be able to do anything with it. So if I think about our training like a fish hook, I call this the fish hook problem. My current state is I got a whole bunch of folks who have a really low data acumen. And then there's this giant gulf, and then there's, there's people who kind of talk amongst themselves, share, uh, get repos with one another, and kind of sit in this like little insulated community. And most of the education is focused at the tip of the fish hook. But what we really wanted to do was invent <laughs> that fish hook. Get these people who are sitting on the sidelines who think this problem doesn't impact them and offer training so we could kind of move them off that Y axis. And we felt that if we would do that, you could see you'd also kind of get a bump of the folks who are on the on the right-hand side of the fish hook. So the Data Literacy 101 course is designed to really invert that fish hook. So this course, uh, as Matt mentioned, we've given it over 30 times. Where has it sort of went? Well, I initially developed it just for JSOC, uh, went and gave it a couple times. Some folks up at the Pentagon got a hold of it and they started saying, hey, would you be willing to travel and give this to other people? I said, well, before I do that, let me go talk to folks like Alice and the, uh, the things that academia says, says we should cover. So we had a peer review process through this where we sat down and said, all right, so it's not just Clark in a vacuum. Is this the type of skills? And we'll kind of go through the skills that we cover in the course here in a little bit. And then once we said, okay, we feel like this is a pretty decent course, we opened it up to the Army and said, all right, is anybody interested in this? And it took off like wildfire. And so the second half of my sabbatical was just me traveling around the country, giving this training. You see a lot of the areas that we went to. Finally, I reached back out to West Point and said, I need help. And uh, Jim took the uh, mantle there and, and he went and gave some of the training too. In fact, we've gotten to the point now where Jim has trained people and they are training people. So now this is, this is woefully incomplete in the number of times this has been given to the Army. And I think if I had a true map, most of the major posts inside of the Department of Defense would be covered. So moving forward, and I'll talk a little bit about this at the end here, moving forward, we've realized that even with the construct we have right now, demand has outstripped our capacity to offer this training. So in June, we'll be offering a train the trainer course, which is a 40 hour course that covers not only the material, but also best pedagogical practices. And it also goes into how do you assess your organization's level of data literacy? And I'll go through the framework that we're going to use here uh, at the end. Um, and, I, and let me pause here to say that if you thought I was going to talk for all hour and a half here, you'll be woefully uh, let down. Um, I, I don't plan on talking for the entire hour and a half. But that being said, if people have questions or comments throughout this process or throughout this 
talk, please chime in. We are, we're a smaller group here, so I'm, I'm willing to take this any way um, that you'd like. And I'm really hoping to get something out of this too, selfishly, if you are doing things in your organization that either look similar to what we're doing or you want to know why we aren't covering blah, happy to engage about that at any point in time during this. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a civilian. I don't have a Wonderful. Of the, uh, military nurse, nurse together work. But so you're, are you saying that you know, as you're at Cap Cable Airport, Cable Airport and you're collecting, you know, someone sitting there with a laptop saying, what's your name? Where do you want to go? Like this, that, the next thing. That person, it could be any private randomly in the entire army that would be trained in understanding how to do that data entry. Or would the idea, be, so like almost like as a basic training when they fix yep. the list, they get that kind of that education. Or is it something that's like, no, like I have training in this and I'm now the person that's going to be, again, on the, on the ground collecting the data interface in it. Great question. So I think there's a couple different levels. I think the the overall goal, though, is those basic skills of, hey, consistency in format, uh, ensure that each of your rows mean the same thing. Our goal is to push that down to the lowest level. And one of the, the big wins that we've had from delivering this training is the Army has actually stepped up now and says, yes, we need to put this inside of all of our professional military education. So I think the goal is at some level, everybody has those basic skills. Now, as you build out that out, there'll be another level of folks who have a little bit more um, detailed skills. Right now, we look at those as the trainers inside of their organization who can kind of look at the, that private who's inputting that data and say, no, you're not doing it right. Or, hey, my organization is drifting. They're no longer a data literate organization. Let me offer some training. So we, we kind of see one trainer inside of each organization, but everybody having these basic skills. And, and my perspective, for us to be a data literate army, that's the level of requirement we have to have. Because I never know who's going to be touching that data before it comes to me. Great question. Yeah. So what does this training look like? We start our training with really defining the question that you want to answer first. So kind of take everything from a decision framework and say, if we really want to be successful, and one of the reasons we weren't successful with the data coming off of Afghanistan is we didn't really know the question that the operational unit wanted to answer from that data. So as we teach this training, the first thing we start with is defining what a data-driven question is. And we use this SMART framework, we want it to be specific, measurable, action-oriented, relevant, and time-bound. And, and one of the things we found in given this is some people pick this up really quickly. But there is other folks, as we teach this, that really struggle to be able to put into words what they want data to achieve for them in the first place. And oftentimes, this becomes an iterative process as we educate people on this. We have them break into groups and try to come up with a data-driven question that's relevant for their organization. And they'll pitch it back to the entire group. And oftentimes, we find ourselves, well, that's not really what you mean. Let me, let me kind of help you get to this. But what we want them to walk away from the training is that at least one good question that data can help answer. And then we use that question throughout the rest of the training, we keep going back to it to, to really highlight the fact that, hey, what we're talking about right now, I might be using a case study that doesn't resonate with you at all because we use a couple of, of real world case studies in the, in the training. But for your problem, this is what that would mean. So it allows us to personalize the training a little bit using this framework. And oftentimes what we find, though, is it, it becomes a little bit of a gotcha thing. So we have them come up with a data-driven question. And inevitably, I don't know, Jim, if, if you found this, most of the questions they come up with on the surface are what we call descriptive analytics questions, which are really straightforward questions. We kind of think about this as what happened in the past. So the one of the examples we use is what what we call our RASP data set. So this is a data set, a real data set um, that we sort of shrunk down and cleaned up a little bit and anonymized that comes from our 75th Ranger Regiment. They have a Ranger assessment and selection process. So this is basically a whole bunch of ranks, whether they're private specialists, whether they're married, airborne, their age, their education, whether they graduated, yes or no. That becomes what we're trying to explain or predict. 
MOS, which is your job title in the Army, what their gender is, their GT score, which is a measure of intellectual capacity, or supposedly there's probably issues with that statement, so let me walk it back a little bit. Um, Push-ups, sit-ups, run, and chin-ups. Um, so this was an actual data set that was brought to me when I was serving in Jim's role as a center director for the Center for Data Analysis and Statistics, where the psychologist from the 75th Range Regiment wanted to know what were the important features in determining whether somebody passes or fails rest. So a descriptive analytics question, what happened in the past, is it's a question like, are older soldiers more or less likely to pass RAS? And most of the time when we ask people to initially come up with a data-driven question, it falls into that category. And we kind of talk about the data requirements that, would, that you would need to answer that question. And, and, and what would that, those be? Data requirements that answer this question? Pretty straightforward, right? I need age and I need whether they passed or not. So the, the data requirements for this are really straightforward. So if that's the only thing you want to know from the data, all this other stuff is, is, is sort of unnecessary. But then we kind of pull this one level back and say, okay, well, let's talk about this. Is this really what you want? Because now let's pretend you go to your commander and you say, older soldiers are more, like, are more likely to pass than younger soldiers. What are they going to say? What's your commander going to say? Mm -hmm. Why? Right? That's a natural follow-on question. And so as we pull on the thread of a descriptive analytics question, we inevitably come to the fact that, no, actually what you really want is a diagnostic question. Why did that phenomenon occur? Is it because the older soldiers are weaker and weakness leads to failure? Is it because older soldiers are more mature and it's a maturity? What we as statisticians would call a causal. Question. We try to stay away from some of those words because sometimes that that you know people put up uh, barriers to to the technical terms when we throw them out there. But really, what we get at is if I really want to know a diagnostic analytics question, what what does that do to my data requirements? It becomes a lot more because now I need to kind of explore the different potential causes or have a firmer idea as to what the hypothesis is that I'm trying to explore. And as we talk about this further, so then we start talking about some of the data requirements for a diagnostic analytics. I say, well, is that it? Like, is that truly what you only want to know? Do I want to know why somebody who's already passed or failed, passed or failed, or do I want to apply this in the future some way? So then we differentiate between a diagnostic analytics and a predictive analytics. And again, I think the, the important point to bring this out in the education as we talk to the force is, is exactly that conversation that we had about AI assurance. If I want an explainable model, that's going to be a different structure, not usually, than if I want a truly just predictive algorithm. If I only care about predicting, that might open up the the types of models that I can use to be a lot wider than a model that's kind of explainable. I think it's sort of, if we're waiting for explainable AI to use AI to the question that was asked in the audience, we're gonna be waiting a long, 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 long time. That's Nick's opinions here. But having that conversation with the user as to whether this is a diagnostic or predictive or whether it's both becomes an important part of the of the communication process. And again, we're not trying to build people that can build algorithms for this. But what I'm trying to do is get my users to clearly define the requirements so that my data analysts who might be not located with my subject matter expert or my commander on the battlefield or my platoon sergeant who's running a operation out of the middle of nowhere, Afghanistan, is sitting. So I, I have to be able to firmly uh, articulate that question at the edge because, again, the person who's doing the analysis might be far away. I really want to make sure that I am clear in my requirements to whoever is, is actually conducting that analysis. Then we kind of talk about what it would mean to even take that one level further. So from a predictive analytics, what's going to happen next, perhaps we truly just want to get to something that's prescriptive. If I do X, then I could expect to see Y occur. And it gets to some notions of optimization, loss functions from those of us who, who sit on the, the you know, higher 
medical level professionals, right, to, to abuse that analogy a little bit, right? So it means something different to me, though, if I am analyzing data. I know they want to get to something that's prescriptive. They want to come up with a decision. What should I do about it? If we change our recruiting to only target soldiers with a GT score over 110, we can expect our pass rate to go from 30% to 50%, saving X amount of dollars. And if we can get them to that point of asking a good question, we really felt like that was the first step in data literacy. So this takes, truthfully, as we go and we do this instruction, this is about a two-hour process of sitting, talking them through this, letting them explore these questions a little bit. And it takes a lot of what we cover day one. So day one is a lot of this, why is this important? What makes a good question? And then going into different types of analytics. At the end of day one, we start to discuss what are those data requirements. So we start to sort of hit that throughout the question formulation process. But at the end of day one, what we really want them to walk away with is not only the question that they're asking, but an idea for what types of data would need to be collected in order to answer that question. So the last thing we do talk about in day one is reading data. And what are the different data types? What can we do to make our data readable? And, and we kind of conclude with some of that same assurance type questions that were asked in the last panel. What can we do as data collectors to ensure that we can trust the data as we input it? We have a little homework at the end of day one, say, come back to us with a data dictionary. That's what we really want them to be able to provide is not only the question that's being asked, but an idea for what the data requirements would be and also what types of data you would expect in any given column. So from selfishly, again, as a statistician, if, if a user provides that to me, like I feel like I can do something with it. Day two, we, we start with a little uh, discussion of correlation versus causation, some of the classic spurious correlation examples. I'd like to, if you're not familiar with the hurricane versus hemicane uh, example, we kind of talk everybody through that um, as, sort of how you can see this manifest in academic literature, um, which by the way, if you haven't read that, I encourage you to go and see why maybe it's not true that uh, female hurricanes are more deadly than male hurricanes. That's sort of the underlying uh, idea behind that example. Uh, then we talk about working with data, and this is an, a chance for the students to see what we would need to do if I have to combine two different data sets, if I have to, to augment my data with another data set. And sometimes they realize that, hey, this isn't an easy process, but there are things that they can do that could help me merge two different data sets. Hey, maybe you need to define what your key is. You need to ensure that if I'm collecting a CAC ID over here, I don't switch to social num social security numbers over here. So again, just some of the best practices in data collection and talking about some of the issues of working with data. Is, and that's sort of the second level of data literacy, being able to work with it. We go through kind of high level, some of the tools for analyzing data. Um, you know, what would you do to do a descriptive analytics? What are some of the statistical techniques you might use? It looks a, maybe a little bit like our MA206 or our introductory statistics course. What, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of this? We talk about some issues of causality, perhaps about some things you might not think you could cover with people who don't have any background. But we do talk about things like randomized controlled trials. What does that mean? Talk about matching. What would it mean to do a propensity score matching? And we don't use these words. We talk about finding a ducks of the same color in two different ponds. But that's what we're really getting at is what would you need to do if you really want to move from this uh, diag or descriptive analytics to a diagnostic analytics? And then finally, we cover some of the algorithms that they talk about, the black box algorithms. What does it mean? You've heard the term deep learning next door. Like, okay. When are these tools appropriate to use? And what does it mean to have something that's explainable versus something that's not explainable? We try to get them to this whole point that there's no such thing as a free lunch. If I want a model that does really, really well with prediction, I'm going to have to sacrifice some of the explainability. And it gets back to that question that they want answered again. If all I care about is doing something that's purely predictive, great. 
love it. Let's just throw model after model after this, do ensemble methods, things that you know humans can't explain. That's fine. But at the end of the day, you're going to come back at me and say, no, I really cared about the why, but don't allow me to go down that path to begin with. So day two really starts to get into the working with data and analyzing data. I will say day three for the students is their favorite day. As the instructor, it's my least favorite day because it's the stuff that I am the least comfortable with. I've taken, uh, I don't know, more statistics courses than I care to think about. And very, very few of them cover how do we communicate effectively from data. I will say we try to do a better job in our education now. Some of you better than others. No, they, they do a great job with it. But day three is all about how do we tell a data story? And I, yeah. Sorry. Um, so, so a lot of what you're going over is very data, data literacy, but it's slanted toward machine learning. Is that? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I, I think when we get into the predictive analytics, it's very machine learning heavy. Okay. But when we talk about um, descriptive analytics and diagnostic analytics, oftentimes, and we really hit this kind of in day three, we just say, hey, you just need to show your data. Like, that's all you need is a good visualization, and you're going to learn something new from it. Okay. okay. And that's a plus plus. Oh, no. no see, honestly, it's like for the like predictive analytics, even, even the uh, diagnostic analytics, uh, I've used just Y equals MX plus B. Like, most of your audience should know equation of a line. And so, hey, if you do least squares, they've probably seen that. At the very least, if they haven't seen least squares, they at least know equation of a line, right? So you say, hey, if I make a change in X, what does that do to my Y? That, that's my prediction. I can also look at the, the beta that's a part of that X or the, the B, or sorry, the M, I guess the slope. <laughs> if I make a unit change in X, this is this is kind of explaining it. So that's kind of what I use as, a, as an example. And it's, it, most people, I think, resonate with that without, without having to go to the machine learning level. Yeah. Well, then I was thinking too, like, yeah. like, you know, sometimes you might have somebody who just wants to do machine learning. Right. Like it, they, and then, then you talk about, like, how do you not see everything as a nail? You know, when you have a hammer kind of thing. Yeah, so we actually, on, on the last day, we go through a case study where we show like the neural network solution to it. And it turns out the data aren't that good and it's it's not that wide of a data set. So a simple linear regression model outperforms the neural network. So we kind of try to take them there a little bit and then kind of come back around and be like, ah, if you wanted to do something fancy, turns out you would have made something that wasn't explainable and it would have been the worst model to use from a purely predictive standpoint, too. So the students love this, though, the telling a data story. And, and what we teach them and is to think really through the narrative of what you're trying to convey, as opposed to oftentimes you, you pick up a book on data communication, and what is it? It's just visualization after visualization after visualization. Like, use this, not this, this, not this. We found a book by Brent Dykes called uh, Telling Data Stories that really encourages you to think through the construct, the narrative, and how do you bring your audience into the problem in order to get them to actually create a change in their organization. So we talk through like what makes an effective story and what doesn't make an effective story. And I will say like this is the one time in probably any uh, any military training that anybody talks about Rick and Morty? Because I, I use a Rick and Morty example in this. If you're not familiar, he has a character arc that, that Dan Harmon sits down for every episode of this show, and he goes through it all eight steps. And at, once you see that and you watch an episode, you realize, like, hey, this is the exact eight steps that they use. So we kind of talk about that. We talk about Freitag's Pyramid, which is another classic storytelling uh, structure. Then we talk about like what it would mean to take your data findings and lay them on top of a template for creating the most effective communication. And then we talk visualizations. So after you've got that, that story architecture in place, you sprinkle the visualizations on top of that to really enhance that narrative. And, and one of the, the points we make over and over again, and this is done because we've seen this fail oftentimes is people who learn just a little bit about this and we we're talking this morning with uh, some of our colleagues that power bi is everywhere in the army now 
just because you make a visualization does not give you the right to subject your audience to it. <laughs> and I say that over and over again, because as it becomes easier and easier to create a graphic, the more and more briefs we see is just graphic after graphic after graphic that don't really lead to any point. The whole point of a story is to have a point. What is it? What is that key finding you want your audience to walk away from? And I will say, as a statistician, I've learned a ton by doing this. And, and hopefully my cadets, as they, they are out here thinking through it, when I tell you things in your brief, it's because of what we learned as we kind of put this stuff through here. So, so we do talk about this. We talk about the biases you have to overcome, kind of the psychology of, of storytelling a little bit. We do talk visualizations. You know, my one big takeaway is never use a pie chart. And, you know, some of the uh, examples of bad visualizations, we talk through Tufti's principles of good data visualization. Uh, but again, it's really done in a way to enhance a narrative rather than making the narrative about the visualization itself. Day four, we talked through a case study. And this goes, this goes to the question of somebody that just wants to use machine learning. So we go back to the RASP data set and say, all right, let's use the CRISP DM frameworks. So now we introduce the cross industry standards and practices for data mining, which is a general framework for how do you approach a new problem. We talked through what it would be to be a case study. And some of these, you know, I always say, this is your chance to watch a surgeon operate a little bit. I'm gonna roll up my sleeves and pretend like I'm the data analyst. You are the subject matter expert that's helping me answer this question. So we talk about some further uh, issues in data wrangling, talk about what feature engineering is in case they hear that term, and, and, and really get them to a point where we've got at least one example of a case study and they can see some of the challenges that might seem uh, easy for them to, to make a mistake on, but from a data scientist standpoint, it's really, really hard to fix that mistake. For example, in the, in the data set itself, one of, the, one of the fun things to do is talk through the run column. And it turns out run is an important predictor as to whether someone's gonna graduate or not, which is great for all us short, skinny runners here. Um, but it turns out if I read that data in, it's read in as a string. It's read in as unstructured data. And I say, okay, well, what would you do to fix it? Well, what do you think? It's converted to seconds, right? Okay, let's try that. It turns out for me, and, and I'm sure, you know, Andrews probably could figure out some R script to do it. It was like a 30 minute problem for me to figure out how to do this. It involved regular expressions, gross. Uh, but it's one of those things that's like really easy to say in words what you wanna do. And the person collecting the data, they weren't doing this maliciously. They weren't like, hey, let's, let's make Clark's life really difficult. They were doing this because that's the way that they were thinking about it. But if they would have just put minutes in one column, seconds in the other column, that would have been simple. Or if they would have converted everything to seconds to begin with, it would have been simple. But it turns out the small choices that are made on the edge sometimes have ramifications downstream that we don't think about when we're just inputting data. So we, we get through that stuff at the end of day four. And again, the, the hope is they walk away from the data literacy 101 and are able to really serve as those combat lifesavers, the people who can input the data at the edge, who can help shape the questions that other people in their formation might want to know so that they make sense to a data analyst. So we're not answering questions that we think are predictive analytics, when in fact, they really want something causal. They want to have something explainable. So we've been giving this course for a while. And one of the things that really bothered me about it, I, I love the course, I love giving it, I love doing it, but I didn't really have a framework for saying whether this was making a difference or not. And as a, as a data guy, I kind of want data on whether this data training is effective. So we've developed a framework that we're just starting to roll out. And how do we assess whether our organization has moved the needle in their data literacy journey or not? So from an individual to an organization, does your organization speak data? And the assessment framework, because we kind of looked across the across the the breadth of possible different ways of doing this, said, well, let's just go to how the DOD communicates in the first place. Why reinvent the wheel? 
If I am putting something new inside of a Department of Defense organization, they're going to use .mil PF. Anything new, we have to consider the doctrine, the organization, the training, the material, the leadership and education, personnel, facilities, and policy. So for a data literate organization, let's look across these different components of .mil PF and say, what should your organization be able to do? Now, for example, for doctrine, looking through how unit makes decisions and, and kind of how we could see this framework being used is if I have a cadre of folks that understand this framework, I get somebody from outside my organization to come and sit with my unit for a, a week, two weeks, and just answer these questions. Does this organization use data to make decisions? Are commanders requiring it? How are these analytics presented? And these are sort of doctrinal type questions that will differ from unit to unit, but a data mature organization is going to be able to use data in a lot of different ways. They're gonna require data to support recommendations and they're gonna have clear requirements of the different staff sections. From the organization, oftentimes we say, hey, I've got my data literate folks and I've got my chief data scientist. Well, is that enough? Have I defined the requirement for these things? Have I identified the data tech experts inside of the organization? Is there a single point of, uh, of failure on this? Is there a senior executive who's, who's overseeing this entire process? Organizationally, am I keeping my data experts siloed from the users? Or are they nested in some way? And are you using best practices for tech development? So those are the type of questions we would say that you should ask organizationally of your unit if we want to figure out if they are if they are data centric, training it's part of training is am I allowing my people to get trained? But another part of training is how do we inject data challenges into the training that my organization is doing? So when I think training, I think our data challenges presented during this training exercises. Do we have time devoted inside my my schedule for upskilling? We do the same thing from material. And this is oftentimes what people think. Oftentimes we jump to a material solution. If I ask a organization in the military, hey, are you data alert? They say, yeah, I got a cloud-based uh, architecture. Okay, that's fine. You, you've met the material sort of requirements, but perhaps you don't have the other things. So I think oftentimes we, we jump to this, worry about the tools and worry about the cloud. We haven't done any other forms of .MLPS. So I think this is actually like the easiest one it's perhaps the most expensive one is the ones that people spend a lot of time writing requirements for. But if this is all I'm doing, my argument is you're missing the other steps of a dot mil PFP. What are we doing with our leaders? One thing we haven't done a good job of yet is figuring out how do we build on exactly the data literacy 101. We've kind of given a couple different frameworks for it. We're still, still turning on a little bit. If anybody has a solutions to that, please let me know. But how am I educating my leaders? Because I don't think, you know, maybe to run counter a little bit, I'm, and I'm sure you didn't quite mean this uh, during the previous thing, but like, I don't think I can expect my leaders to really get into the nuts and bolts of the algorithms for AI. So what are those requirements for our leaders to, to really know? What do we want them to do? But certainly they need to enforce these data standards and these collection policies. So one of the things we would ask is, as you assess your organization, what is that enforcement mechanism? Tree falls in the woods. If a data uh, standards are written, but they're not actually enforced, who cares? And if it's just my tech experts on the sideline who are coming up with those data standards and the leadership at that highest level aren't enforcing that on my subordinate commanders, we're in for a, a long day. Personnel, I mean, went to Data Literacy 101. <laughs> Got to throw my plug in there. Uh, but but how, how have you identified your trainers, your data engineers, your data scientists? And really, and one of the things we, I, I know the Department of Defense is talking about right now is from the civilian side, what does it mean to have a job code for a data scientist? Like, is this somebody's full-time job? Am I taking this out of Hive? Or is this, hey, an, a, a tasker that they have? And they're just going to get pulled down in the motor pool anyhow on Monday, and they're not actually going to get to do their job. 
Facilities, dedicated work sport, space, location for the training to occur, libraries, and finally policy. And you see some of these things overlap with one another. And, and this is just our, our first attempt at a framework for assessing the organization. Again, how we would see this being used is not every single one of these questions relates to every single organization. However, I think for an organization to see itself, it would require somebody who's got some expertise to come and kind of do an audit of that organization. Uh, if, if anyone's in academia and perhaps you're familiar with accreditation processes, when you accredit a program, you accredit an institution, you have somebody from the outside who comes and looks at your program and says, Are, you're not doing these three things that you said you were going to do. So from the organization standpoint, I think it's important for you to define what levels of .mil PFP relate for you. And then from an assessment standpoint, I think you should have an outside person that comes and says, okay, you said your organization was doing X, Y, and Z. I'm not seeing any evidence of that. So I'm just gonna wrap up here um, and, and certainly have some time for, for questions. But the overall recommendations I have for organizations or individuals within an organization is just start, just try something. Just do it and find your pain points. Don't wait for the perfect algorithm. Don't wait for your organization to have uh, R and Python and all the libraries installed every single place. Like there are questions we can ask. There are data we can gather now. And you're gonna learn something about your organization as you go through that process. Try something. And walking out of Data Literacy 101, we've given you a question. We've given you a data dictionary go start collecting that data. Invest in education. Um, I, I, I love the fact that, uh, that Ms. Fox had said that this morning. From, from a green suit perspective, we need to educate our force. This needs to not be the training that we do on, you know, everybody in wears a uniform has done that training where you click through it and get to the certificate that you upload somewhere. Like that's not what I'm talking about when I say educate the, the force. We need to invest in it. We need to build the time and the space and then reinforce that organizationally with a structure that allows people to do this. Here's where I see people fail, quite frankly. Uh, I call this the, the LinkedIn graveyard. You hire an outside expert who's been really successful in XYZ company, Silicon Valley. Hey, they, they, they made this work. They say, hey, I'm just gonna come in, I'm gonna steamroll this bureaucracy. Guess what? Our bureaucracy is unsteamrollable. You're not gonna do it. There's nothing wrong with hiring a chief data officer from, from outside the HQE structure in the military has allowed uh, us to bring in some, some outstanding talent. But if they're not operating within our system, within our process, if they don't take the time to know it, all that's gonna happen is they're gonna try to steamroll it. They're gonna get really, really bitter because it's not steamrolled, it's not, it's not steamrollable. And they're just gonna quit and write something really scathing about the Department of Defense on LinkedIn on their way out the door seen it over and over and over again. Don't rely solely on them to fix your problems. You need to integrate them into the system, into the processes. You need to partner them with the existing subject matter experts inside your formation. To that end, embed your data team at the edge of the problem. If you're doing PT and you got a contractor who's from wherever and they're part of your team, invite them to go do PT with you. They're going at the range. Invite them to go shoot a weapon with you. We need to build that team so we don't have an us versus them mentality on this. Think about your data team as a member rather than a consultant. Invest early on in data engineers. We think through what we need to really make this infrastructure happen. Oftentimes, we're, we're sitting waiting on people that can format our data, get in the right format, sure we have good uh, security and governance processes. If you build it, they will come. If 
if I had uh, 100 uh, people I could hire, I would hire 98 data engineers and two data scientists early on. That'll flip later on once you get those processes in place and, and you mature that ecosystem a little bit. But it, it isn't a waste investment early on. Swing a dead cat right now and hit a senior leader who talks about AI. You know, going back to AI is the solution. All right, but what's the question? What is the question? Don't worry about AI or machine learning unless you have a use case for it. Oftentimes, simple analytics will get the job done. Good data collection processes, well-defined questions. I don't need more than what Andrew's teaching in MA206 to answer what I could need to do. That's our basic statistics course. Sometimes it's just a visualization that answers the question I have. Just because industry is doing it doesn't mean it's going to work in our case. It may be that chat GPT revolutionizes the, the military. It might be. We really need to think through whether that is the solution to the problems that we have before we say, why aren't I using this? I'm going to close here with some of the resources I like. Uh, I talk about uh, Be Data Literate by Jordan Mora and Effective Dory's Data Storytelling by Brent Dykes. And quite frankly, anything out of Tufty writes, I pick up and I read and I have on my bookshelf there because I like how he thinks about visualizations. If you want a more in-depth understanding as to data literacy, some of the issues that they have, I love this website because I like to, to curse and I get to say call him bullshit. Like <laughs> some universities out in the universe or some professors out of the University of Washington developed a course called Calling Bullshit and they put all their course materials online. Uh, including all their lectures and all their assignments, completely free. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful, um, and and I strongly agree with what uh, what they have there. So I'll wrap up here saying, even though I'm wearing a uniform here, these are all just my opinions. <laughs> I won't even put Jim on the spot. You can blame me for anything that's said. If it sounds good, he probably had developed it. Um, but they don't reflect DOD or, or West Point policy have the Department of Defense. However, I will say that when you come up with a solution, the rest of the Army likes to readily adopt it because it's hard to start with a blank sheet of paper. So I do see a lot of this data literacy 101 training getting proliferated throughout the force. And as our PME or professional military education has been directed to implement data literacy at every single center of excellence in the Army, TRADOC recently came out with that directive. I think what you're going to see is more and more leaders we at least been exposed to the type of things that we went through today. So I have my contact information is up here. Please reach out if you love it. Like any of my materials, make this freely available. If you want any of the data literacy 101 materials themselves, you want to see the slides that we present, the handouts that we give to the students, happy to share them. Please send me a note. Uh, if you want to talk more about this, if you have ideas for how this could work inside your organization or not work inside your organization, or whether your organization does something better, I'd love to get that information. There's not enough people doing education for the force right now kind of in this space. So that's all I got. I'll hang out if anyone has any questions. Or, um, okay, we have a little bit of time yeah. left. So if anyone has any questions for Colonel Clark, uh, we can use that time to talk about some stuff. I have a few, no one else is gonna jump in. Um, yes, sir. So we've like talked about this a few months ago, but. Um, like we've discussed how we send kids to med school every year and they can go do that whole thing and then instantly apply their knowledge. Whereas like we'll have to serve a few years in the ordinary job and not be able to really yeah. um, take part in data science for a bit before we can like move over into a functional area. So I guess, what do you see for like junior officers like that we can do since we're already like trained in this area? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And, and unfortunately, it, Oftentimes we bleed talent because we don't allow the people that have the, the specialty training to walk into a, uh, a data science job um, until they're, they've already been in the force five years. So, so what Jack's talking about is, is Jack and a couple of the other uh, cadets here are going to go to grad school after West Point. So we've got a great fellowship program. They're going to go uh, get master's degree in, in data science or data analytics or applied mathematics. And right now, the Army doesn't have a process to really take them into the force and take advantage of the skills that they have learned. Um, 
it's something that I think the senior leaders are aware of, but we've been beholden to this idea that inside of the military, you can go and you can change your branch. So I was a military intelligence officer for the first uh, 12 years of my career, and then I switched over to our functional areas. Uh, functional Area 49, our ORSAs are the ones that kind of do this for the Army. There isn't a really mechanism for somebody with two or three years in the service to move quickly over to Functional Area 49. I will say some of that has become waverable. So we have seen some examples of people that do that, and you want to take advantage of those as you see it. And then the military is also starting to partner with organizations like Carnegie Mellon, um, where they'll take people branch and material and go get some additional education and work for places like AI2C. So there are some opportunities out there, but I haven't seen a big push for a, a skill, a, a specific um, job structure like a medical workforce yet. I don't quit until you get that chance. So I'll ask something. Um, one of the challenges that we faced here at Ida when thinking about how we are going to educate ensure the level of data literacy across our organization is at, is where we want it, is that different areas within the organization, different roles within the organization require, like data literacy means a different thing depending on your role. And so the one-on-one -on -one course that you outlined is a good sort of baselining of that. But have you thought about how depending on different roles, and you talked a little bit about the challenge with the articulating what data literacy is for leadership, yeah. Uh, but add different you know, roles, different positions within uh, the service, within the DOD. Have you thought about how you would build up different areas of data literacy? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, and I think, like I'll, I'll punt a little bit on it in that like we're such a wide range of different jobs inside of the Army that it outside of the baseline skills, and we see these as baseline skills, it really does depend on, on where you sit. So I think the way forward on that is through partnership between us and the centers of excellence uh, who can de develop the specific uh, job requirements for their branch. Um, I, I don't think we're in a position right now where I could come up with for, the, for all the different uh, branches in the military, this is what it means for you. Um, Jim, I know we talked about like a 201. It's just hard. It's like, okay, we do a 201, like, for, you can do Intel, maybe I can do artillery, that's my background, but it's like, to make it all comfy for everybody, it's like, what what, is, what do they need, right? And, yeah. And then yes. just start with Excel, because that's ubiquitous on server machines, right? Uh, but again, R and Python, not everyone needs that as well, yeah. so that's kind Absolutely. of... Absolutely. Yeah. And then what are, the, what are the use cases too, right? So, yeah, that's, that's the hard part is what's next. No, I still have a day job. <laughs> so I'll just give you one example. Folks are dealing with like personnel data on yeah. a regular basis. Like that requires a different skill set, a different set of training um, for the particulars of that. So it's it's branch. You'd, mm -hmm. you'd have different um, requirements potentially. So start, yeah. even within that, depending on the types of data and what you're using it for, you may have different requirements that make sort of like a four day course like this. Uh, maybe that's maybe you'd have to like fractionalize it even further, where you just have modules and you build them up or something. And I think there is some some space for us to team with academia on this. Yes. I know NC Space looked a lot at how they could build out something right now. It's not only a more in-depth uh, training, but you're also getting you know, college credit for it too, because that's the other thing too, is you, you go through this and, and you kind of walk away with maybe a handshake and a certificate that I printed off a printer, but career-wise, it, it'd be nice to be able to offer some of the different um, benefits of partnering with academia. So I'm not actually sure when this ends. I think we might be right at time. Okay. Um, anyone can correct me? Okay. <laughs> yeah, let's say yes. So uh, in that case, let's thank our speaker um, for now.